part two of R.C. Sproul talking about man's radical condition. Another translation reads, unless the Father enables him. Now those words don't all mean the same thing. To grant means to give permission. To give means to give a gift. And to enable means to empower. All right? So there is a certain ambiguity here about what that necessary condition is. And there's another question that is still hanging out here, and that is, if a necessary condition is provided, not, now we're not talking about coming to Jesus, in any situation, if a necessary condition is provided in a situation, does a necessary condition guarantee that the result you want will in fact take place? Now, that's why we make a distinction between necessary conditions and sufficient conditions. A sufficient condition is a condition that, if it is met, guarantees the result. It suffices. An example of a necessary condition would be in the case of fire, if you want to build a fire, oxygen is a necessary condition for there to be a fire. But the mere presence of oxygen does not guarantee a fire. Okay? Now, if you have a dry piece of paper and plenty of oxygen, and then you light a match and touch that match onto the piece of paper, then you'll have a fire because the burning fire from the match is a sufficient condition to ignite a dry piece of paper under those conditions, granted that the other necessary conditions have been fulfilled. Do you understand the difference now? So, all of this verse is teaching is that in terms of man's natural ability, none of us has the ability in and of ourselves to come to Christ. Unless God does something. We're still not sure exactly what it is that God does. And we're still not sure that if God does it, it will guarantee that people will come. All we know is that whatever it is that God does is a necessary condition, a prerequisite. Okay? Some have jumped to another verse here in, in, in John 6 where Jesus says, All whom the Father give to me, come to me. And that suggests that uh, everybody who gets this necessary condition then indeed do come. But that's not exactly how those two verses are related to each other. Uh, see if we're sharp enough to see the difference. Jesus says that uh, all whom the Father gives to me come to me. No one, no one can come to me unless the Father gives it to him. Now that almost sounds like uh, that everybody that, the fa that is given to him to come are those who are included in the ones that the Father gives to the Son. But remember, in the one case, the giving is to us. In the other case, the giving is to Jesus, so we can't equate those two statements, even though I believe they are, in fact, uh, parallel. <coughs> but the, linguistically, we can't prove it. So we're still left with this ambiguity as to what must happen. What is the nature of this necessary condition? Well, notice that Jesus here said that he'd already told them that. That he's indicating that this is a repetition. He says, for this reason I have said to you. So he's now repeating himself. So let's, let's see if we can find the earlier statement that is either identical or close enough to probably be the statement that Jesus is referring to. Well, if we look earlier in the chapter, we have another universal negative and another statement about necessary conditions and about man's moral ability. We find that in verse 44. No one can come to me. Does that sound familiar? No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. Now it's not quite as ambiguous. Here, the necessary condition that Jesus spells out is that the Father draws somebody. So can we say this categorically without any fear of being contradicted that our Lord Jesus Christ taught that it is impossible for a human being to come to the Lord Jesus Christ unless that person is drawn by the Father. 
Now, I might add at this point that both those of an Augustinian persuasion and of a semi-Pelagian persuasion agree that there is some kind of necessary condition that God must supply. God must draw people. But there's still a debate. And the debate is, what does it mean that God draws? Now, the classical Arminian approach to this, or semi-Pelagian approach to this, is that nobody can come to Jesus unless the Father entices him or woos him. Again, that's usually tied into some notion of prevenient grace or the influence of the Holy Spirit to, to woo and to entice. And the word draw here is interpreted to mean to woo or to attract. Just as honey draws bees and lights draw moths, but the idea is that the drawing that God does is still resistible. And those who respond to the enticement, those who respond to being wooed, are then redeemed according to Arminianism, and those who do not respond to being drawn are subsequently lost. The Augustinian interpretation of the verse is that the word to draw means more than simply to entice or to woo. Now, let's see how this Greek word is used elsewhere in the New Testament. If we would turn our Bibles here to James 2, chapter 2, verse 6, we will find this same Greek word used in the New Testament in the second chapter of the book of James. In the sixth verse, I shall read the verse. But you have dishonored the poor man. Is it not the rich who oppress you and personally drag you into court? I'm going to ask you to guess which word is used in this verse that is exactly the same Greek word that is translated by the word draw in John 6. Does anybody have a guess? Drag. It, now let's let's supply the semi-Pelagian interpretation. But you have dishonored the poor man. Is it not the rich who oppress you and personally woo you into court? Okay. Let's look at another one. Let's look at Acts chapter 16. Verse 19, which I will read. But when her master...